Hi folks, uh, this is Jason and I uh, hope you are okay today. Uh, this is a public lecture on um, the Christology of Karl Barth and I hope this is a blessing to you. Um, this lecture will not be a normal way of expounding Karl Barth. Uh, we shall try a new method, a method that is growing among some academics. That method is to go behind what Barth says. Every theologian has a context. If we understood the intellectual and cultural context of Barth, uh, it will shed great light on his Christology. This lecture will be in six parts. Barth in context. Barth. Third, testing the foundations. Fourth, living under the shadow of Kant. Five, three Reformed theologians, and then six, Bart on Bart. Bart in context, his intellectual development and theology in general. Bart was born in 1886. He was brought up in a God-fearing family. In his student days, Bart went to study at Marburg and Tübingen. At this time, about 1909, there was a great intellectual rest in Europe. Expressionism was a sign of the times, a revolt against the Philistine culture. Barth writes, quote, We find ourselves in a deep dis disfaction with everything hereafter. End of quote. The thinkers who influenced Barth in his student days were Cohen and Wilhelm Hermann. Cohen was a philosopher who saw God as important to fill the gaps. Hermann was much more important to Barth's development and influence in his Christology. As a true Kantian, Hermann thought religion was independent of science. Hermann also had a deep-seated dislike of natural theology. Hermann's epistemology started with God, and he was a despiser of historical relativism. By 1913, Barth was now a pastor. He began to preach on God's wrath. He was much involved in socialist activities, but already Barth was growing as a theologian. He reacted against his peers who signed the manifesto back in the German government. He was developing his epistemology, trying to make God the ground of knowledge to the knower. From 1915 to 1920, Barth's dialectical method was in full swing. Quote, Barth's theological development from this point on represented a single theme, God is God. End of quote, uh, McGormack. This epistemology was also, also influenced by his brother Henrik Barth, 1890-1965. Quote, God, not essence, but pure ursprung of everything that is. End of quote. McGormack. By the time Barth had written Romans, he was influenced by Franz Overbeck, 1837-1905. He began to see the incarnation as a divine possibility. Kant's philosophy he still took for granted. Quote, Barth was anti-metaphysical in character, end of quote, McGormack. But Barth's Christology was not at all well developed until after he started lecturing at Göttingen in 1924. His first attempts at Christology were in relation to Revelation. Quote, it would be more accurate to Barth's intentions to say that Jesus of Nazareth standing on the plane of history is not even the medium of revelation. As a historical figure, Jesus is the veil of revelation, but no more than that. End of quote. McGormack. Quote, it means, it, it means that the new world touches the old world at a single point without extension along the line of historical time. End of quote. The veiling and unveiling ideas Barth kept throughout his theological development, but his time and eternity apparatus he did not take seriously. He now began to ground his theology more in Christology, using Reformed Dogmaticus as a basis. Quote, Before turning to Barth's interpretation of the Incarnation, it should be noted that in presupposing the self-revelation of God in Jesus Christ, Barth was placing the Orthodox Christology of the 16th, 16th century on entirely new formation. End of quote. Uh, McGormack. Quote, what is in view is a unity in different action, a strictly dialectical union, which nowhere sets aside the qualitative distinction. By 1925 to 30, Barth never went back on his general idea of the presence of God. 
and the veil of creaturely flesh being a presence in reality that is different from God. The only difference now, as from his early days, Bath now saw the whole of Christ's life as significant, not just the cross and the resurrection. Also at this time, Bath was not happy with Bruner's apologetics. As for Bath, Buchan and Salmi did not change his Christology significantly. This is just a skeleton of some key developments in Bath's thinking. Some of Bath's overall theology are as follows. Number one, hermeneutics. Secular culture must not be allowed to bring its tools and impose itself on the text. Number two, revelation, God's words and existential act. Number three, theology is a worshipping of God with our whole mind so we might enjoy him and bring glory to him. For what is a bringer of knowledge to the knower, the knower has in no ability, has, ha, the knower has no ability to know God. Five, Christological thinking tells us let God be God. Next, Bart, Bart's uh, Christology. In Bart's Gottingham Lectures, Bart says we can never take God's place. God is a living God. God can do all things. Bart says that no person can do what God does, that is, become an object perceptible to others. God is the only one that can make himself known. Next, he says that God must use a person, a real person, but conceal himself. God must not be a direct revealer. God must truly meet man, so that Jesus must be a literal human, not an angel or a phantom. Next, Bath says that deity and humanity must be united, but they must not be mixed into each other. Quote, Loose inasmuch as the deity does not pass into the humanity, or the humanity become identical um, with deity. It must be strictly dialectical union. The deity and humanity must be distinguished in such a way that we cannot detract the one from the other. End of quote. Bart then goes on to say that the deity must not be above the humanity of Jesus. The incarnation must be seen as one for all event. The next points out that the incarnation is the objective possibility of revelation. But it's the end of Jesus' life that has more significance for Christology. The traditional view here that history is important for Christology is left behind. The Bible for Bart is not closed revelation, but others outside the Bible could receive revelation. For Bath, indirect communication equals God's incarnation. Bath then points out that Jesus, the man, is God himself who reveals God himself. That becomes man. This point he makes clear, then he notes that we have to remember that there is depth in God beyond the Incarnation. For Bath, the Incarnation is the answer to man's contradictory existence. He states this position so dazzling here, quote, It is not a changing of the divine nature of the Son, but with his divine mode of existence, the Son takes a human mode of existence, uniting it, the grace of union to his person, just as the divine mode of existence is an eternally united to his person, yet without any way altering his divine mode of existence. End of quote. Uh, page 156. Quote, uh, that was Karl Barth. Not, quote again, not the deity become man, but the son, although naturally without ceasing to be who he is, and therein, and with his entire deity, in contrast to the human nature that the son assumes and unites to his person, is the persons. The substance of man, his being, is a body and soul with all the limitations of the limitations this means. End of quote. Karl Barth. Quote, the logos in Christ's flesh and the logos outside Christ's flesh are naturally not two different ent entities. The one a revealing part of the logos and the other a part that remains hidden. Quote, uh, end of quote. Bromley, page 2-5. Bath's view changed a little in his life. In his Christology, in the dogmatics expand in John 1.14, we have the following teaching. Number one, word is very God. The word is subject of what happens. The word acts in divine freedom. The word does not stop to be free or sovereign in becoming flesh. If God is the subject, then, then matter, then mother of God idea is correct, but Mariology is to be rejected. A true humanity, uh, his flesh participates in all the human nature or essence. He is reckoned a sinner 
on our behalf, flesh denotes likeness, it points to sinless life and obedience. End of quote. Bromley, page 2.5. When in the Bible text he says become, Barth insists it does not mean surrender a being as the word. That is why Barth liked to use the word assumed as it protected the integrity of the word. Barth kept up his love of seeing Jesus as the concrete existence that makes history real and reveals God. Quote, the heart of the object of Christian faith is the word of the action which God from all eternity will to become man in Jesus Christ. End of quote. Bath Dogmatics Outline, page 65. Testing the Foundations, McGrath and Hart. What was Bath trying to do in his Christology? Bath to free theology from culture. He writes, quote, page 31, McGrath. For Bart, the recognition that God revealed himself as Lord in Jesus Christ was the means by which theology could be freed from the baleful influence of culture, anthropology, metaphysical, allowing it initially to become emancipated from its cultural matrix and subsequently to develop and maintain its intellectual autonomy. End of quote. This helps us to start on a critical assessment of Bart's Christology. In my reading of his lectures on Gottingen, the dogmatics in outline and other pieces, one is actually aware how abstract Bath's Christology is. It is totally unrelated to the world he wrote in. When he writes about the man Jesus, it is never in the context of how he relates to man in the 20th century, and most certainly not to specific life situations. This lack of bringing Christology into reflection with the culture of the day stifles debate and development. Quote, to detach oneself from a tradition is to impede the process of understanding which takes place within precisely such a tradition, end of quote, McGrath, page 34. The next problem we have with Bar's Christology is he tried to minimize the importance of history in its classical sense. History for him was not a sure basis to construct theology. In a sense, Barth wants us to receive Christ as a possibility without data. I think this means the word does not really become flesh in space-time, but hovers over flesh in the recipient of faith. Quote, if Bath's Logos truly became Sarx, the particular way in which the becoming of the union between the two is consistently construed in his theology, nonetheless risk reducing it to the point where it loses all purchase in the real world, thereby robbing it of genuine redemptive and relative, uh, relative, relative, relevatory substance, end of quote. It has also been noted that Barth tried to deal with Furenbach's accusation against 19th century theology, which was too anthropological. anthropological. Barth's Gottingham Christology was trying to give religious knowledge objectivity but his putting the doctrine of Christology with revelation does not achieve objectivity and weakens the foundations of Christology proper. The antithesis and thesis of word and God will not lead to synthesis of dialectical union of the person of Christ, precisely because it's only a possibility and possibility does not make for objective reality. Bath Christology is also weakened by the ideas of veiling and unveiling of God, that is, God reveals himself in history but not real history, it might use concrete language, but Bath is really only saying that the divine only touches the man, man Christ. This might seem to contradict Bath's ideas on sacrifice on, on the surface of his teaching, but Bath held tenaciously to the veiling theology, which comes out strongly at Gottingham, but less so in his dogmatics. Quote, Bath's own terms, by mistaking the veil of the flesh for that which it veils, such approaches fail to inquire into what really matters and shut themselves off, from the possibility of the veil becoming an open door, end of quote. Next point, living under the shadow of Kant. As the young lecturer, as the young lecturer thundered his theology at Gottingen, he was a John the Baptist crying in the wilderness of liberal theology, a theology sunk in the sand, in the sand of a subjectivity. Bath, with all his brilliance, was going to put the West back on objective theological rock. But as he was doing his theology, just as the liberals lived under the shadow of Kant's philosophy, so he did the same. Bath's whole Christianity with a touch of Ockham thrown in. Ockham believed God by his power can make us have initiative. 
in, intuitive knowledge of an object that does not exist. My contention is then that Bath lived under the shadow of Kant. Kant tried to show that religion had nothing to fear from science because reason scientifically considered could not verify religious statements. This is why Bath says the subject cannot know but the object can make the subject know. The whole of Bath's Christology is foundation found, founded on this. What has happened is objective verification of facts for religion has been destroyed. The historical Christ then is non-verifiable. If Bath would have taken on Neo-Kantian philosophy and not accepted it, then his Christology would have been better off, uh, be better off than Kant. He would have been optimistic about human nature, skeptical of, of Prussian morality. Sorry, I'll do that again. If Bart would have taken on Neo-Kantian philosophy and not accepted it, then his Christology would have been better off. Kant, optimistic about human nature, skeptical about knowledge, full of Prussian morality, failed to even think that God could work through history. It is at this point Kant and Barth failed to see the strategic importance of having a Christ rooted in verifiable historical data. Quote, instead of asking how our knowledge can confirm to its conform to its object, we must start from the supposition that objects must conform to our knowledge. Quote, Kenny, page 252. Reformed theologians. I shall now use three theologians to help me be critical of Bar. These reformed theologians have their blind spots. They are not too narrow at times and they only interact with their own faith community. They are locked, in my opinion, to Hamilton's common sense philosophy. Charles Hodge points out in his systematic theology that Christ's incarnation does not mean that one nature participates in the attributes of the other, no, but rather that the person is the partaker of the attributes of both natures. This means that whatever may be affirmed of their nature, well, it may be affirmed of the person. Now granted that Barth uses the word assumed in his Christology, it is still true because of his veiling ideas to say that Barth's God enters the world and is present within a hypostatically while yet remaining utterly distinct from it by nature. So the old orthodox view of Hodge's hypostatic union and two natures, the sharing of attributes, is simply destroyed. If this is a good point, I don't know, but Barth's view is really, in reality, two natures, no union. Hodge, page 392. I understand this cuts across much of Barthian, Barthian scholarship. I must take this point further. I think that Barth was clear on the issue of the two natures, but on the union not so. He was using a dialectical method. The Son of God is in eternity, came down to earth, was a dialectical tool. He was using language of orthodoxy as a vehicle for his dialectical program, in, in my view. His hypostatic union was a dialectical code, not a real divine being. He wanted to bridge the gap between the finite and the infinite, but there was no middle ground. This dialecticism, Van Til notes, quote, It is therefore in line with Burkauer's criticism to say that mutually exclusive view of scripture involved two mutually exclusive views of God and man, and only the Christ of scripture rather than the Christ of Bath can save us from communism. End of quote, uh, Van Til, page 135. In my opinion, Barth was in truth more scholastic than reformational. Barth built his Christology on a philosophical basis. It has great strengths in that it gives preeminence to God, but it has great weaknesses that it gets the main points of orthodoxy. Uh, it has great weaknesses. He gets the main point of orthodoxy, but penetrates it with over-philosophizing the analogy of faith. Keeping to the Bible in reformational sense would have, would have its problems, but it would help to avoid over-speculation, which Bart indulges in. Bart on Bart. Conclusion. The conclusions of this lecture are as follows. Bart's Christology was generally the same throughout his career, influenced by his veiling of God idea and Neo-Kantianism. Two, Barth's Christology was essentially orthodox on the surface realism, it was strong on the hypostatic 
it was strong on hypostatic union. The foundations of Bath's Christology were shaky because it failed to interact with culture, it minimized the real history of Jesus, it mixed veiling philosophy with his Christology. For Bath was not critical of Kantanov, he never thought as the Richelians did, that real history could be verified. This means Jesus' life was open to investigation, which means real knowledge of God would be attained. The God is God of Bath was not satisfactory as it was not grounded in verifiable historical data. 5. This means for all Bath's talk that the Son assumed flesh, it was but a dialectical tool. He never really bridged the gap between the God-man. In the end, Bath's Christology is a scholastic speculation, grand in scope, dazzling in its intellectual thought at the historical point above. It is this point of not grounding his Christology in real history that causes problems for Bath's theology, but Bath will have none of it. Bath's letter, page 168. I wrestle in vain, says Bath with the question by what right you manage to wrest the doctrine of the revelation of God enacted in Jesus indeed the very existence and life of God in Jesus identity with him on the basis of the figure of your historical Jesus and his message and commitment to God confirmed by his resurrection from the dead end of quote Panning, Panningbird replied in this letter below I agree with what it says it also is a good summary of what I have tried to establish and uh, quote uh, Bath Letters, P, page 350. It has been my concern not to begin with the generality of socio soteriological anthropology cut of God-man unity, but rather with a highly particular and unique fact of the historical events of Jesus of Nazareth. End of quote. Okay, uh, these are the references for this lecture. Uh, Karl Barth, Dogmatics in Outline, SCM, London, 1949. Karl Barth, The Gottingham Dogmatics, Volume 1, Erdman's Grand Rapids, 1990. Karl Barth's Letters, 1961-68, TNT Clark, Edinburgh, 1981. J. Bowden, Karl Barth, SCM Books, London, 1971. Introduction to the Theology of Karl Barth, TNT Clark, Edinburgh, 1979, G. Bromley. T. Hart, Regarding Karl Barth, Paternoster Press, London, 1999. C. Hodge, Systematic Theology, Volume 2, Erdman's Grand Rapids, 1901 to 1993. 1901, republished 1993. Mr. Press, 1986. A. Kenny, A Brief History of Western Philosophy, Blackwell, Massachusetts, 1998. A. McGrath, Reckoning with Bart, Mowbray, London, 1998. B. McGormack, Karl Barth, Critically, Reali Critically Realist Dialectical Theology, Clarendon Press, Oxford, 1997. T. Torrance, Karl Barth, Biblical and Evangelical Theologian, T. T. Clark, Edinburgh, 1990. C. Van Til, Christianity and Barthinianism, The Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing Company, Philadelphia, 1962. And B. 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 Warfield, Christology and Criticism, Baker Book House, Grand Rapids, 1929. On Karl Barth's scholarship, uh, I would recommend three books to read out of all those. I would recommend B. McGormack's Karl Barth Critical Realist Dialectical Theology, Clarendon Press, Oxford, 1997. Books ever written on Karl Barth's intellectual development. In fact, I think it's one of the best books ever written on Karl Barth. T. Torrance, Karl Barth, Biblical and Evangelical Theologian. Um, was an expert in uh, Karl Barth and so I would recommend that you look at him and from a conservative reform position Cornelius Van Til Christianity and Barthinianism uh, is a book that will give you uh, the conservative evangelical just to note the C. Tamville Cornelius Van Til position on Karl Barth is a, is a small minority in the academic world when it comes to Barthian scholarship but um, it, what what a lot of Bartian scholars don't realize is that Cornelius Van Til was an expert on Karl Barth. Van Til read all of Barth's dogmatics. So when he writes on Barth, he's writing from a very authoritative position. But Cornelius Van Til's scholarship on Barth ignored by the academic world of Bartian scholars. 
and uh, that's an injustice and unfair. But yeah, uh, B. McGormack, uh, Karl Barth, Critical Realist Dialectical Theology is an absolutely brilliant book. Uh, Torrance, T. Torrance on Karl Barth uh, was an expert and C. Van Til is an expert from a more reformed evangelical point of view. There are two lectures that you can go and listen to um, by Francis Schaeffer at the Brie Fellowship on Karl Barth uh, on Neo-Orthodoxy. Uh, so if you want to look at Karl Barth's theology, Neo-Orthodoxy by, um, by uh, Francis Schaeffer is um, two excellent lectures that will help you uh, to think through this issue. Uh, on the Biblical Seminary, there is uh, a department on Karl Barth there uh, with research material. If you want to do essays and academic research, I think that's perhaps the best place in the world to go to uh, to do a PhD or do research on Karl Barth because uh, they have a, a big reputation at Princeton of having a department on Karl Barth. So I hope that's uh, helped to you and I uh, hope it will help you and stimulate you in uh, studying um, the theology of Karl Barth. Thank you for listening and God bless you.